great. Emperor of Rome. Caesar Augustus. He built a new Rome. And a new religion. He merged them into an empire that lasted for centuries. And changed the world forever. His power, authority, and influence shaped our world. This is his story. A story of romance, intrigue, power, and conquest. Constantine the Great. Game Changer. Constantine the Great. Caesar, Emperor of Rome the illegitimate peasant boy who rises to become the most powerful man on earth. He rules the greatest empire the world has ever seen. An empire that stretches from the Atlantic Ocean to the Euphrates River, from Britain to Africa. But how can he hold this great far-flung empire together? Well, he comes up with an ingenious plan. He unites his empire under one great system, one that combines church and state, that combines all religions, including Christianity and paganism. He creates a substitute, a counterfeit empire. And so now, in a sense, there are two empires, Caesar's and Christ's, Rome and Christianity, a counterfeit empire and the true empire. There's a clash of empires. And it seems as if the imposter, the counterfeit empire, with all its power, wealth and control, will triumph. But now, the empire, the true empire, strikes back. Not with swords, spears and shields, but with the word, the way, the truth and the life. Let's follow and watch as the battle unfolds, as the empire strikes back. Incredible as it may seem, much of the history of the world has been shaped inside the borders of the tiny country of Israel. This land has great significance to Jews, Christians and Muslims and is referred to by many as the Holy Land. It was here that Solomon built his temple. Jesus Christ was born, lived and died. Judaism, Christianity and Islam the three great monotheistic religions share Jerusalem as a holy city. It's the most sacred city in the world and the most important one in Bible history. It has a special significance to Christians because it was here that Jesus was tried, crucified, buried and rose again. With such importance, it's not surprising that Jerusalem played a major role in the establishment of the counterfeit empire. Here's what happened. Constantine was born around 272 AD in Nisus, now the city of Nis in southern Serbia. Through a series of amazing coincidences and astonishing achievements, Constantine is crowned Augustus, ruler of the Western Empire in York, Britain on the death of his father. But he wants more. He has ambitions to rule the entire empire and so marches on Rome itself. On the way, he sees a fiery cross of light superimposed on the sun and attached to it in Greek were the words, in this sign you will conquer. Now, Constantine, himself a pagan sun worshiper, converts and embraces Christianity and his army, with his new symbol, the Cairo, emblazoned on their shields, is victorious at the famous battle of the Milvian Bridge. And now the entire empire is his. Constantine, the illegitimate child of a peasant girl, is now the most powerful man on earth, the emperor of Rome. He credited the Christian God with being responsible for his victory and rise to power. In return, 
Constantine pulled Christianity out of the shadows and made it the premier religion of the Roman Empire. But there's a lot of controversy over the relationship between Constantine and Christianity. Because you see, there's no historical evidence that Constantine was truly converted to Christianity. He never completely left his pagan roots and continued many pagan practices, including the veneration of the sun. So the evidence suggests rather that he was an opportunist who used Christianity for political gain. Constantine knew that he was going to have to find some way to keep the vast empire together, some way to achieve harmony. And that's where he needed Christianity. His strategy was clear and simple. Constantine would try to hold the empire together by uniting pagans and Christians in one great system of religion. He would create a substitute, a divergent empire, a counterfeit empire. Constantine believed that if he could merge the Christian church with Rome, then this would be the recipe to long-term political stability. So he became actively involved in church affairs and administration. The end result was the unification of church and state. Constantine organized and attended the great church councils and played a major role in the decisions of doctrine and teaching. Early Christians had always determined their beliefs based on what the Bible taught, but now a change began to take place. The state and outside influences, rather than the Bible, began to interfere and determine what the church believed. The Bible was no longer the final authority in religious matters. The emperor himself had a say and played a major role. That's clearly seen at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, one of the most important church councils in history. It established a unified definition of what Christians believe. Constantine played a leading role, emphasizing his new position as the de facto head of the church. As well as presiding over the Council of Nicaea, Constantine embarked on an ambitious church building program that included building the first basilica dedicated to Peter in Rome. Then a year after the council, he commissioned his mother Helena to travel to Jerusalem to rediscover the sites associated with notable events in Jesus' life, with the intention to build great churches at these sites as well. She would also search for relics items belonging to Jesus or people associated with him. Constantine's initiative paved the way for the transformation of Jerusalem into the holy city of Christianity and changed the fate of Jerusalem forever. Although his mother, Helena, arrived in Jerusalem about 300 years after the time of Jesus, during which time the city was totally destroyed on at least two occasions, she claimed to locate the exact places associated with important events in Jesus' life. She allegedly found the very spot where Jesus was born, the field where the shepherds saw the angel, the place where Joseph's carpentry shop stood, the location where Jesus was baptized, the spot near Galilee where the miracle of fish and loaves occurred, the place where Jesus stood when He gave the Sermon on the Mount. She spotted the room where Jesus turned water into wine, the spot where Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss, the actual path Jesus took on His way to the cross, the Via Dolorosa. She found where He was crucified, buried and resurrected and where He ascended to heaven. She claimed to find them all. But that's not all. She found more. She allegedly found the very items used by Jesus and associated with His crucifixion. She claimed to find the true cross, the title of the cross, the nails of the crucifixion, the crown of thorns, Jesus' tunic, the sponge, the spear and the burial clothes. Other relics included the bones and possessions 
of the apostles and people associated with Jesus. These so-called discoveries here in Jerusalem and the Holy Land brought about a radical change in Christianity and the church. Until this time, no one had really concentrated on the sites of Jesus' homeland and where he had presumably walked and worked. But now everything changed. Some of Christianity's greatest and most sacred churches were built on these sites and they developed a pilgrimage trail for those who wished to visit all the gospel sites. Christian visitors started arriving in vast numbers. Jerusalem was no longer an outpost on the edge of Rome's territory. Now it was a vital, even central part of the new empire. And the relics, these objects, supposedly associated with Jesus or those close to Him, including the bones, teeth, hair and possessions of the apostles and saints, were taken back to Rome by Helena. And there they started a craze of the veneration of sacred objects. The people of Western Europe became obsessed with relics. And before long, it seemed that every church in Europe either had or wanted some sort of relic to attract visitors and grow their congregation. Relics were put on display or placed in the altar or housed in special tombs. People believed that relics could heal the sick, extinguish fires, protect villages and defeat armies. All of this fueled the demand for relics and a very lucrative market developed around relics. So for religious, economic and even political reasons, the number of relics gradually grew until there were literally thousands in existence. Relics became a massive profiteering scam and there was a lot of fraud involved. For example, it's been said that you could build a large ship from all the pieces of wood claimed to be from Jesus' cross. And there are more than a thousand nails said to have been used at His crucifixion. There are several heads said to belong to John the Baptist. And there are at least 28 tombs of the apostles when Jesus only had 12 of them. So it's obvious that religious relics are often fraudulent. But the real problem went much deeper than that. You see, the first followers of Jesus and the early Christians based all their beliefs on the pure teachings of Jesus and His Word, the Bible. Salvation and holiness came through belief and faith in Jesus alone. But now all that changed. Instead of putting their faith in Jesus, people started venerating relics. These relics became objects of devotion. People believed that by getting close to objects associated with some holy person or saint, that person's holiness was in some way shared with them or transferred to them. They believe that's how you got holy. That's how you obtained salvation. Relics, pilgrimages and images became central to Christianity. Access to Jesus and salvation was no longer through faith and belief, but through images and objects of devotion. And so the concept of relics, of holy stuff, subtly undermined the central message of Christianity, the message of Jesus and the Bible. Sadly, the church had adopted the beliefs and practices of paganism. Christianity became popular, so much so that pagans were baptised into the church. Now, these pagans joined the church, but they also brought many of their pagan images, objects, beliefs and practices with them. The reverence of relics, veneration of saints, the use of temples and candles, holy water, holy days and seasons, all had their origins in paganism. And many were approved and accepted into the church during the fourth century, the time of Constantine. He radically changed the church and its beliefs. Aside from Christ and the Bible writers, no one has exerted more influence on the Christian church than Constantine. He was 
a game changer. In fact, his mark remains with us to this day and it's deeply embedded in the structure and function of much of Christianity. Here's what one historian writes. Paganism survived in the form of ancient rites and customs condoned or accepted and transformed by an often indulgent church. Paganism passed like maternal blood into the new religion. The church, the fortress of truth that Jesus and the apostles built, was weakened and changed by the insidious introduction and spread of relics, pagan objects, beliefs and practices. Christianity was corrupted. And by accommodating paganism and compromising with the state, what our Christian ancestors did was to launch what we might call a substitute, a counterfeit empire. It looked like Christianity. It sounded like Christianity, but it had some real problems. It was an imposter, a counterfeit empire. But now the empire, the true empire, strikes back. Not with swords, spears and shields, but with the Word, the way, the truth and the life. You see, God was not caught unawares or unprepared. God launches the ultimate counterattack based on Jesus Christ and His Word. Yes, God had a plan, a strategy. He would keep the flame of truth alive through faithful followers his witnesses who refused to accept the false teaching and pagan practices that had infiltrated the church. They remained faithful to the pure teachings of Jesus and His Word, the Bible. Groups such as the Waldenses, who lived high up in the Piedmont Valleys of Northern Italy, nestled below the spectacular Alps. They obtained a translation of the Bible and so possessed Bible truth in its pure form. They rejected the imposter, the counterfeit empire, and its corrupted form of Christianity. They remained faithful to the Bible and kept alive the pure teachings of Jesus and the apostles. They taught their young people the great truths of the Bible and trained them for the service of God. These young people then went down into the villages and cities of Italy and beyond. They explained that God is a God of love and mercy who accepts people on the basis of their faith, their belief in Him. And they shared this powerful message from the Word of God. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's how we're saved, only by believing in Jesus. So the empire, the true empire, strikes back. Through His followers, who are faithful to God and His Word, the empire, Christ's empire, responds. God in His mercy sends messengers to reform the church. Virtually all of these great reformers came from within the established church itself. Most of them were priests. They passionately desired that the church reform and correct the abuses and paganism that had crept in. One of the first and most influential of these men was John Wycliffe, often called the Morning Star of the Reformation. He was an English priest and the leading philosopher of the 14th century, who spent most of his career as a scholar and professor at Oxford University. He began to study the Bible in depth as he prepared for his classes and discovered that the church was teaching doctrines and practices that he just couldn't find anywhere in the Bible. This greatly troubled him. Wycliffe began to preach against the false teachings of the church and also against its corruption and abuses. This resulted in a clash of empires. It brought the wrath of the church against him. He was banished from his post at Oxford and sent as pastor to the church at Lutterworth. Here, he undertook the monumental task of translating all of the Bible into English for the common people, so that they could have access to God's Word. But the clash of empires raged. 
Wycliffe was condemned by the established church and died of a stroke in 1384. But that wasn't the end of his message and influence. Bohemian students who studied under Wycliffe at Oxford carried his writings and teachings back to Prague, where they influenced Jan Hus, a bright young priest and lecturer at the University of Prague. As Hus studied the Bible, he became convinced that John Wycliffe was correct and the church had indeed wandered from the pure teaching of Jesus and the Bible and desperately needed reforming. Jan Hus began speaking out boldly against the false teachings and corruption of the church. The teachings of Hus challenged the great medieval church and the counterfeit empire. He could only meet trouble for his beliefs. In 1415, he was summoned to the city of Constance on the Swiss-German border to defend his teachings. There, after a mockery of a trial, he was condemned to death and burned at the stake and his ashes thrown into the Rhine River. He was a courageous reformer, but he wasn't alone in his desire to see the church reform and return to the pure teachings of Jesus as found in the Bible. Others began echoing Huss's call for the church to reform and return to the Bible. They understood the clash of empires that was taking place. They realized what was at stake. And for them, the principles of God's Word were not only something to live for, but something to die for. Sadly, the church rejected their calls for reform and either attacked or executed them. However, their efforts were not in vain because their work, vision and sacrifice laid the groundwork for the next great battle as the empire strikes back. Other reformers were beginning to question if it would ever be possible to reform the established church. And it was this realization that led the Augustinian monk Martin Luther to nail his 95 Theses to the Wittenberg Cathedral door and launch the Reformation, a significant event in this clash of empires. It began with Luther's desperate desire to find peace of mind and the assurance of salvation. He believed that the only way to do this was to become holy, to rid himself of sin and save his soul by his own good works. When the Augustinian monastery selected him to head a delegation to Rome in 1510, Luther was overjoyed. Here was his opportunity to use the traditional remedies provided by the church to find forgiveness and peace and become holy. But the trip was a disaster. Even though he visited as many holy relics as he could, he felt no closer to God and returned to the monastery more troubled and disillusioned than ever. In desperation, he began studying his Bible as never before. To his surprise, as he studied God's Word, he found no teaching about venerating relics or making yourself holy, of earning God's acceptance or buying forgiveness. As he studied the Bible book of Romans, he made a discovery that would forever bring peace to his troubled heart. The just shall live by faith. Luther finally grasped the truth that salvation comes by faith, by believing in Jesus Christ. He understood that relics, sacred places and objects did nothing for his salvation. The Christian God is a God of love and mercy who accepts people just as they are on the basis of their faith in Him. Luther vigorously and loudly proclaimed the Bible truth. Salvation is free. There's nothing you can do to earn it. Salvation is a gift. Luther could hardly believe this good news. Despite the mistakes he had made in his life, despite his guiltiness, he could be credited with holiness because Jesus, who really is holy, suffered His penalty on the cross. So now, people can be forgiven freely, forgiven in the Lord Jesus Christ. This Bible message, the Gospel, 
struck a major blow for God's empire. It soon spread all over Europe, across to America, down to Australia and New Zealand, and on around the world. This good news, the Gospel, changes people's lives and brings them inner peace and happiness and eternal life. It really makes a difference, and it's the major difference between the two empires. In fact, it's still the primary battleground between the two empires. You see, the battle is not over. The clash of empires continues. There are two competing empires in our world. God's empire, based on Jesus and His Word, and the counterfeit, based on tradition. Both are vying for our allegiance. The choice is yours. If you'd like to be a part of God's empire and honour His Word in your life by accepting Jesus and following Him, and if you'd like to dig deeper into these important questions, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our incredible journey viewers today. It's the enduring classic, The Great Controversy. This book is our gift to you and is absolutely free. There are no costs or obligations whatsoever. Thousands have been blessed and inspired by this book, The Great Controversy. Don't miss this wonderful opportunity to receive the gift we have for you today. Phone or text us at 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or visit our website TIJ TV to request today's free offer and we'll send it to you totally free of charge and with no obligation. Write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia or PO Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now. Be sure to join us again next week. Until then, May God bless you and keep you faithful to Him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word, the Bible, our ultimate authority in life and a powerful weapon in the clash of empires. And thank You for Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, who's coming back soon to establish Your everlasting Kingdom. We all want to be citizens in Your Kingdom. Help us to be faithful to You. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen.